please be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. Routine proceedings, uh, introduction of bills, committee reports, tabling reports, the Honor Minister of Justice. Okay, we'll go on to uh, ministerial statements. Member statements. The Honor Member for Riding Mountain. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Irene Gammy of Strathclair has been inducted into the Manitoba Fiddle Association Wall of Fame in the accompanist category. Born in 1930 on the family farm in the rural municipality of Edward in southwestern Manitoba, Irene remembers being paid 10 cents for taking her turn at the piano, courting for dances at the Enola School, probably when she was just 11 years old. After she moved with her family to Pearson, Irene played for regular Saturday night dances in the hall with the local orchestra, which included her brother Ines, who played the fiddle. Irene married Roy Gammy of Strathclaire, who was also a fiddler, in 1955. The couple passed their love of fiddling and old-time music to many family members. Four grandchildren play the fiddle. All three of her children, as well as all five grandchildren, chord either on the piano or guitar. Irene became the organist at the Strathclair United Church in the late 1950s, and she continues in that role today. As well as accompanying many fiddlers in competitions and at, and at talent nights, Irene found the time to play twice a month with the Harmony Music Makers for 20 years from 1981 to 2001. She also joined the Strathclair Seniors Orchestra, the Carlton Toe Tappers, in the late 1980s, playing at area dances and providing entertainment at local events. Currently, Irene accompanies two of her grandsons when they play at local bars, the Strathclair Community Centre and at other events. How cool is it to have your grandmother play with you in a bar? Mr. Deputy Speaker, on behalf of all Manitobans, I want to thank Irene Gammy for her contribution to music in Manitoba, congratulate her on her very worthy induction into the Manitoba Fiddle Association Wall of Fame. The Honourable Governor and House Leader. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, could you canvass the House to see if there is a will to revert to tabling of reports following all the members' statements? Is the will of the House to actually revert back to uh, tabling reports after the ministers, after the uh, member statements? Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. I rise today to pay tribute to a great young Manitoban by the name of Liam James Moore Young, or Lemon to his grandma. Liam's mom describes the eight-year-old as always happy, really smart and good with technology. She tells me her goal has always been to make every day good for him, and that's meant trips to the zoo, Assiniboine Park, and Liam's favorite, the forks, walking around, climbing on structures, playing with bugs. Now Liam faced some challenges early on. He was diagnosed with autism, but his parents got him help. And because of that, Liam developed a tremendous love for going to class. Everything about school he loves, the schoolwork, gym class, making art, music class. Just an enthusiastic student with a great love for being at school. Did I mention his school friends? Because there are many. But of all his interests, though, number one, trains. At a young age, Liam developed a love of trains, watching them, talking about them, playing with toy trains. Liam recently told his mom, I want to work with trains when I get big. Sounds like the type of dream shared by so many Manitoba children. Sadly, Liam passed away just four days before Christmas. He is dearly missed by his mom and dad, his little brother Landon, his aunties, cousins, and grandparents. Now, I never had the chance to get to know young Liam. I simply opened the mail one day to find his Aunt Sheila had made this mask and sent it to me in his memory. So I wear it in the chamber and give this speech with the family's permission so that the memory of this good Manitoba boy, Liam James Moore Young, can live on in the permanent record of our legislature forever. The honor member for Dawson Trail.
Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm honored today to introduce to you a remarkable young lady who has been recognized provincially for her countless hours of volunteerism and community service. Carmen Trudeau is a grade 10 student from St. Anne Collegiate. Carmen loves her family and it is incredibly important to her. She has two sisters aged 12 and seven. She also has two cats of her own and her family also fosters dogs from Lexi's rescue. At times, they may have up to eight dogs. Carmen, when she was only seven years old, began volunteering by spending time with seniors at Villa Uville in St. Anne. She would play bingo, go for walks with residents and peel potatoes. She has brought smiles to many people's faces. Carmen cannot wait to get back there once COVID is passed. Carmen has also volunteered at the Richer Rodeo, Summer in the City, Teddy Bear Picnics, Mini Soccer Coaching, Kinsmick Creek Animal Sanctuary. She also volunteered her time helping pets at Walden Way Canine and Kitty Camp. After countless hours of volunteering at the camp, she is now a paid employee. She also works at BP Sport Horses, working with the horses. Carmen has an incredibly supportive friend and she is thankful for. Her friend Katie often comes to volunteer with her. Carmen was the recipient of this year's Student Citizenship Award from the Manitoba School Board Association for her exemplary and outstanding role in her community. She received a signed certificate as well as a prize of 1,000, which she plans on investing half for her post-secondary education and the other half on something fun for herself. Carmen believes that citizenship means you are willing to go above and beyond for your community to make a better place for everyone. Please join me in recognizing another Dawson Trail hero, Carmen Trudeau. The Honourable Member for the Paul Camisac. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Today, I want to highlight the achievements of Connor Roulette, a rising young star in Canadian hockey who recently won a gold medal representing Team Canada at the under-18 IIHF World Hockey Championships. Canada went undefeated in the tournament, winning their first gold medal since 2013 and beating Russia in the final five goals to three. Connor put his first round NHL potential on display at the World Championships, scoring two goals and three assists in the seven games he played. Connor's achievements are no surprise to his mother, who's known for a long time that Connor would eventually have to leave home to pursue his hockey dream. Before being selected for Team Canada, Connor moved down south to play left wing for the Seattle Thunderbirds, where he scored 19 goals and 20 assists in 54 games in his rookie season with the WHL team. His coaches describe him as a well-rounded offensive threat who is talented enough to potentially lead the league in scoring. However, for Connor, hockey is not just about scoring goals and winning games. It's also about being a role model for other Indigenous youth. Roulette comes from Mr. Powastic Cree Nation and has said that it's an honour to represent his family and all Indigenous children when he's out on the ice. He takes pride in the fact that many Indigenous kids come from his home community and across Canada have reached out to him expressing their support and looking for advice. I want to wish Connor nothing but the best in his future and I look forward to continue seeing him on the ice for many years to come. Today is another big milestone for Connor as it's also his 18th birthday so please join me in congratulating him on his outstanding achievements and wishing him a very happy birthday. Egwese. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I note that yesterday new members were chosen to receive the Order of Manitoba, the province's highest honour. The ceremony of the Order is always a special one. It's a humbling reminder of the many extraordinary people from all walks of life and their contributions to our province enriching every aspect of our lives. And I mean that. Science and innovation, agriculture, the economy, sports, music, arts, television, film, heritage, philanthropy and politics representing institutions that define Manitoba, Indigenous history, the Folk Festival, the, Ma the Manitoba Museum, and the Blue Bombers, to name just a few. We certainly hope the third wave will have diminished and it'll make it safe to gather again on July 15th for the ceremony. This year's inductees include Mr. Steve Bell, Mr. Franken Lynn Bishop, Elder Ruth Christie, Dr. Michael Eskin, Dr. Gordon Goldsborough, Mr. Greg Hansen, Mr. Kyle Irving, Ms. Ava Kabrinsky, Ms. Claudette LeClaire, Ms. Doris May Olton, Mr. Greg Selinger, and Mr. Arnie Thorstenson. Of those inductees, I have the pleasure of knowing three, two of whom are constituents. I grew up with Greg Hansen's nephew, Darren, who says his uncle is a great man. He's right. 
I worked with Claudette Leclerc at the Manitoba Museum, which is one of my favorite places in the world. Kudos to her. And congratulations to Greg Selinger, who served St. Boniface and Manitobans as a city councilor, MLA minister and premier. We thank him for his service. When I see these accomplishments, it reminds me of a plaque at the New Iceland Museum in Gimli. Therefore, when we build, let us think that we build forever. Let it not be for present delight, nor present use alone. Let it be such work as our descendants will thank us for, and let us think as we lay stone upon stone that a time is to come when these stones will be held sacred because our hands have touched them, and that they may say, as they look upon the labor and wrought substance of them, see, this our forebears did for us. Congratulations again. Felicitation. As agreed, we're going to uh, go back to tabling reports. The Honourable Member, Minister for Justice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to uh, table the following report for the Department of Justice, the 2018 Annual Review of the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Now for order of questions, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, I want to thank the uh, Minister of Justice for getting us so pumped up as we head into QP with the tabling of the reports there. We know that there have been 560 new cases today of COVID-19, which is the highest non-adjusted case count we've seen in a single day. But now, we also know that hospitals in Winnipeg and in Brandon are continuing to be understaffed. There's a staff shortage precisely when we need them the most. I'll table these documents for consideration of the House, which show that in the weeks ahead, as we are dealing with the impacts of the rising case counts of the third wave, that there will be 15 empty nursing positions at the Grace Hospital's ICU. Why has the Premier left hospitals in such a staff shortage position as we deal with the third wave? The Honourable First Minister. Well, we've just announced 60 new full-time ICU positions oh. held. Uh, we recognize, of course, the challenges that all frontline workers, all of us as uh, people are facing as a consequence of this pandemic, but in particular those on the front line, and applaud them and thank them for their work. Uh, we did inherit a mess in terms of the health care uh, system in our province. We are endeavoring to clean it up and we are especially motivated uh, by the situation that has arisen as a consequence of the COVID pandemic. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. You know, it's National Nursing Week. What we hear when we talk to nurses is that the healthcare system is worse than it's ever been. That statement started before the pandemic. The pandemic has only served to burden and stress out nurses even further, the PC caucus claps for an announcement yeah. mid-third wave that they're going to start looking for help. Yeah. But if you're trying to fill 60 positions while well, you already have 15 nurses short at the Grace Hospital ICU, this third wave is going to be very difficult for Manitobans. Why has the Premier cut health care over the course of his time in office, and why does he refuse to admit the mistakes he's made? The Honourable First Minister. Three quarters of a billion dollars of additional investment in health care isn't uh, well defined as a cut. The member opposite is uh, unfortunately resorting to political posturing to try to achieve a political advantage during a global pandemic. I would emphasize to the members of the House again that these investments that we are making are focused, have been focused, and will continue to be focused on improving access to service and service not just during this pandemic but going forward as well. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a final supplementary question. The health care system is short 1,300 nurses. 1,300 nurses missing who should be caring for people at the bedside but are not there because of the cuts that this government has made. They've cut nursing positions. They've cut health care support at the bedside. I'll table the document again. 15 nurses who won't be there in the ICU precisely at the time that we need the most. Most. We know that there's also an issue in the ERs, both at the Grace, at Brandon, at hospitals throughout the province. 
The PC obsession with cutting healthcare resources served us poorly before the pandemic, but now as case counts continue to rise in the third wave, it gets even more serious. Why has the premier cut healthcare staff leading up to the pandemic, and why hasn't he learned from his mistakes? The Honourable First Minister. Again, unadmitted mistakes is a theme that the member can uh, uh, speak to with great authority here in the chamber and elsewhere, but chooses not to. The fact of the matter is we're investing three quarters of a billion dollars Order. more in health care this year alone. This was pre-pandemic, I should mention, Mr. Speaker. More than the NDP ever invested. I should mention that 12.6 new ICU positions from Brandon Hospital have already been filled. I should mention also that the previous NDP government promised to end hallway medicine and created an even worse situation during their time in office. And so I would uh, emphasize to the members office that it is most certainly true that according to the Canadian Institute of Health Information, Manitoba at the end of the NDP term had the longest waits for emergency treatment in the country of Canada. We inherited a mess, we're cleaning it up. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a different question. Well, the nurse is at the bedside. Tell us things are getting worse. They're as bad as they've ever been, and it's because of this government. We also know that it's because of this government that Manitoba Hydro is being forced into this campaign to try and discredit itself, to try and mistreat the very workers who give it health. This government has sought to obstruct the people of Manitoba's right to know what is going on with their most important Crown Corporation. Luckily, Bill 35 has not passed, and we still have a public utilities board who has stepped in to order Manitoba Hydro to show the people the truth about its financial health. The question remains for the Premier to answer. It's very simple. Will he order Manitoba Hydro to comply with the public utilities board today? The Honourable First Minister. So, speaking of not learning from the mistakes of the past, the member has just said that we should do what the NDP did when they were in government, which was to direct and interfere with Manitoba Hydro's operations, to disrespect the management and staff of Manitoba Hydro, and to di furthermore, to disrespect the people at the Public Utilities Board in the process. And we won't do any of those things. What we'll do instead is make the Public Utilities Board stronger with multi-year hearings that will be more transparent so that never again can a $10 billion series of projects be pushed through without the Public Utilities Board even having a chance to review them before billions of dollars is invested. Again, a mess at Manitoba Hydro caused by the deception by Pole West Line, deceit by the previous NDP government that can never happen again. With these reforms in place, it will never happen again because the real owners of Manitoba Hydro are Manitobans, not the NDP. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. If the Premier has nothing to hide, he should call for a general yeah. rate application at the Public Utilities Board today. What are you afraid of? But he won't. He's afraid that his political narrative, carefully constructed with taxpayer money, will fall apart. We know what he's going to do in the absence of a public utilities board. Ask yourself, Mr. Deputy Speaker, why haven't we seen the budget implementation bill yet? Is it because they're planning to raise hydro rates again? They raised it during the second wave. We're in the third wave now. I guess they're going to raise hydro rates again. Will the Premier simply put an end to this charade and order Manitoba Hydro to comply with the Public Utilities Board right now. The Honourable First Minister, order. Well, again, the, the member speaks of something uh, which he knows, deceit and cover-ups are certainly the thing of his past and that of the NDP. And the fact is they tripled the debt of Manitoba Hydro without asking the owners for permission without asking the Public Utilities Board, which he now pretends he stands behind. Actually, Mr. Speaker, the NDP had never shown any respect during their time in office for the Public Utilities Board. And the fact of the matter is, we have the respect for the Public Utilities Board in mind with these reforms, which will put us in line. Multi-year rate setting is what virtually every other jurisdiction does. 
will put us in line in terms of the transparency and disclosure requirements with other jurisdictions. The NDP says they're opposed to those changes. Why are they opposed to openness? Why do they want to keep the present system, which allowed them to cover things up? The order, order. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a final supplementary question. We're opposed to the PC Cabinet raising hydro right. rates on Manitobans without a public hearing. That's right. It's that simple. We're opposed to them doing it again a second time this year. That's right. If the Premier believes anything of what he's just shared in the House today, call a public hearing. Let the Public Utilities Board take a close examination of the facts and let them tell the people of Manitoba where the truth is. But we know that they won't do that. Instead, the PC caucus will continue to clap for their flailing leader as he claims to liberate the Public Utilities Board from their responsibility to regulate Manitoba Hydro, just as they turn around and liberate Manitobans from more money from their bank accounts as they raise their Manitoba Hydro rates. Let's put a stop to this. Will the Premier simply order Manitoba Hydro to comply with the Public Utilities Board today? The Honourable First Minister. Well, what, let's be clear what the number is advocating for. He's advocating for political interference in the operations of Manitoba Hydro. No, we'll not do that. He's advocating for political interference in the operations of the Public Utilities Board. No, we will not do that either. Instead, he's also advocating for an increase in rates as a consequence of the millions, tens of millions of dollars that has to be spent for rate application hearings in this province and almost alone is this province. Every time there's a rate application hearing, it costs millions of dollars for Manitoba Hydro, for Manitoba Public Insurance, for everyone else. In fact, in the past 10 years alone, Mr. Speaker, if the member, if the member would stop spouting, and might, he might learn something. Order. In the last, get, get a little control, recklessly out of control yet again. In the last 10 years alone, Manitoba Hydro's ratepayers have had to pay 92 million dollars for rate hearings every two years and we're virtually the only province where ratepayers have to pay that that pushes rates up we're having an interim low rate increase we're saving manitoba hydro bring it in the light the honorable member for fort gary you know it's not just Order. anyone in, in Manitoba who gets breaks on their luxury tax for their third residence in a foreign country, but Manitoba's premier does. An 80% amnesty on taxes he was dodging. The important thing in Manitoba is that any political leader needs to be honest with Manitobans. When asked about the amnesty on his tax dodge, his spokesperson said that the premier, quote, did not request to take part in any such program. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's an application-based amnesty. The Premier applied for the amnesty and he timed his application in order to maximize the benefit he would personally get. Why is this Premier once again trying to mislead Manitobans? Order. I just want to remind everybody in the House that when we're in virtual, we can't hear them and Hansard can't hear them, so if, and if they're actually members of your own team, so I, if everybody can have some decorum here. Um, the Honourable First Minister. Mr. Speaker, I do appreciate any question from any member of the NDP on taxes. So the senior members of the NDP have alleged that their leader, presently in place, did not pay his taxes for many, many years. Now, I have paid mine. My life is an open book. But he has not allegedly paid his. Now, he has the opportunity to address this issue. He could provide some evidence that he has paid his. And I invite him to clear the air. I invite him to say that he has, in fact, fully paid his income taxes in Manitoba and Canada. And if he has, I look forward to him saying so. Order. The clocks are ticking. The Honourable Member for Fort Gary on a supplementary question. All I can say, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is wow. Uh, this Premier certainly lives in an alternative reality. Now, this Premier dodged a flood and said he was at a wedding in Calgary. 
Turns out he was in Costa Rica. This premier dodged his taxes. Then he said they were paid. Turns out he got an am amnesty. Now the premier is caught in a web that he himself has spun. He tells the media he had no knowledge of the amnesty and that he did not request to take part in any such program, but you had to apply for this program. And we know this premier not only applied for it, he timed his application to maximize his benefit. Whether it's his conduct in Costa Rica or in Manitoba, why should anyone trust anything this premier says? The Honourable First Minister. I was at a family wedding in Lacombe, not Calgary, and I would invite the member opposite again. I would invite the member opposite Order. again to declare. Since, 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 Mr. Speaker, my family's taxes Order. are fair game. Since my family's taxes are fair game, and I accept that, and I answer questions about that all the time, then I think it is only fair. Then I think it is only fair that the Leader of the Opposition should answer the same types of questions about his tax background. If my taxes are an issue, why would his not be an issue? This is an issue of fairness. And so I can only say, if the member would simply avail themselves of the opportunity, it is not me making the allegation, it is his own people. If he won't even address this issue with his own people when they raise it, then I would suggest he's fueling the idea that he has something to hide. Taxes, it is an honour to pay them and I pay them. Does he? Does he? Are you done now? The Honourable Member for Fort Gary on a final supplementary question. Well, for once, I, I think I agree with the Premier. This is about tax fairness. Now, this uh, Premier got a break on taxes when he dodged, uh, you know, for his third residence, his tropical villa in Costa Rica. But that wasn't enough for him. Now, back in Manitoba, he wants big breaks on his second residence as well as his mansion on Wellington Crescent. Bill 71 puts thousands of dollars a year in the Premier's pocket. He's doing this while clawing back benefits from renters, many of whom are the critical workers fighting this pandemic. It's obscene, it's out of touch, and completely in character for a Premier who governs only for himself and for his friends. Why does this Premier and his ministers think there is one set of rules for them and another the harsher set of up. rules for the rest of Manitobans? Time's up. The Honourable First Minister. We'll be making additional investments, significant investments in the education system using general revenue. The major way that you fuel general revenue is uh, in every other province, not taxes on property. Not taxes on property. My rebate is actually lower than the leader of the NDPs and the member who just asked the question. The actual fact is we'll raise money for education from income taxes. And so my question for the member opposite is why does he not feel that he has the obligation to prove to Manitobans that he pays his. Order. Order. The only member for St. John's. Miigwech, uh, Deputy Speaker. William Amo, a 45-year-old Indigenous father from my home community of Saguenay First Nation, died February 14th, 2021, after an altercation uh, while housed at Headingley Correctional Facility. Laura um, Corey Sheffman, working with Mr. Amo's uh, family, recently uncovered it, that the altercation that led to William's death started with racist jokes and ended up with stun grenades and gas canisters. There is a clear need for an independent investigation into Mr. Amo's death. Will the minister call for an independent inquiry into Mr. William Amo's death today. The Honourable Minister of Justice. The member for uh, St. John's is the critic for justice and clearly understands that there is a process that is involved whenever there is a death in corrections. Uh, it's always a tragedy when there is a death in corrections and that member knows very well that the RCMP's major crimes unit is investigating this and I'm not able to make any comment while that investigation continues its important and independent work. 
The Honourable Member for St. John's on a supplementary question. Which Deputy Speaker, the details emerging are disturbing. William, an unarmed man, but for some reason, guards needed to use full tactical gear, stun grenades, and gas canisters to respond to his reaction at racist comments. William Ammo's mom, Darlene, deserves to know what happened to her son leading up to his, her, his death. I spoke with Darlene just an hour ago, and she shared with me, and I quote, I want answers. I don't want this swept under the rug. My son was a human being and didn't deserve to die like that. He was supposed to be in their care. I want accountability within the justice system. Will the minister answer the call of a grieving mother and call an independent investigation into Mr. Wamo's time is up. death? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, the member and I have found a point of agreement. The family does deserve answers, and that is why there is an independent investigation undertaken by the RCMP's Major Crimes Unit into this matter. When that work is concluded, it will be reported to the family and to all Manitobans. Any death in custody is also reported to the Chief Medical Examiner, and an inquiry will follow under this process. The Honourable Member for St. John's on a final supplementary question. M uh, Mr. Ammo is one of six citizens to die in correctional institutions in Manitoba in 2020 alone. In Manitoba, approximately 75% of all people in correctional facilities are Indigenous, and 70% of those citizens, including Mr. Ammo, have not been convicted of the crime that they're accused of committing. Uh, this government must call a public inquiry into the deaths of all people incarcerated in Manitoba, as well as the systemic racism that is present within the justice system. The need for transparency and accountability is greater than ever. Will the minister restore mandatory inquiries into the deaths of all peoples in correctional facilities in Manitoba today? The Auto Minister of Justice. That member knows that in Manitoba there is a very significant process that is put into place when there is a death of an inmate in custody in one of our correctional institutions. That process is now underway with the RCMP Major Crimes Unit investigating. When that process is concluded, it will be reported to my office and will be reported to Manitobans. Uh, the death will be reported to the uh, Chief Medical Examination, uh, Examiner's Office and inquiry will follow. The issue is this. We have confidence in the process that is now underway. All members should have confidence in the process that is underway. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Mr. Deputy Speaker, cuts and consolidation left our hospitals in horrible shape. Over 1,500 nurse vacancies in Winnipeg and Prairie Mountain regions alone. And the Palliser government cut 70 nurse training spaces at Red River College. Manitoba hospitals are facing the cresting third wave of this pandemic in far worse shape than they should have. Now, other provinces chose not to cut as this government did, and they went much further in recruiting internationally educated nurses. They made credential transfer and recognition far more affordable and fair. Manitoba has done none of this. We are losing talented people to other provinces when we need them. Why has this government not prioritized internationally educated nurses? The Honourable Minister of Health and Seniors Care. I thank the member for the question. In fact, we are expanding the Bachelor of Nursing programs uh, to get more registered nurses into our system. Uh, 20 new spaces have been created in the University College of the North Diploma and Practical Nursing Program, which is now being offered to students uh, in and around the Thompson and Flin Flon areas. Uh, we're working hand in hand with the Provincial Nominee Program to find indiv individuals with professional nursing backgrounds. So we'll continue to work uh, to ensure that we get um, more nurses in the province of Manitoba. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame on a supplementary question. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, whatever this minister says they are doing is not enough. Cuts in consolidation have left a hole. Chief Nurse Lynette Siragusa concedes that there is now a nursing shortage in Manitoba. Small wonder, as one of the first acts of this PC government was to cut benefits for graduating nurses. Other provinces have not done so. I'll table information about an Ontario nurse program. They are providing a $10,000 bonus for a commitment of one year of service. Ontario also funds direct support for internationally educated nurses. In British Columbia, they're offering free accommodations. In Manitoba, nurses have been without a contract for four years, and this government has cut training spaces, and they have not prioritized internationally educated nurses. Why is this government driving frontline health care into the ground? The Honourable Minister for Health and Seniors Thank Care. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And recruitment and retention of nurses is, is nothing new uh, in the province of Manitoba. It was something that was uh, alive and well under the previous NDP government. Uh, we're continuing to clean up their mess. Uh, we'll work very closely with the College of uh, Nurses uh, to ensure that we recruit uh, more nurses. And uh, we'll, uh, we are continuing to train uh, more and more nurses. We did announce last week, in fact, 60 more uh, ICU nurses that were uh, that were trained, and uh, and and um, we will be uh, adding to uh, to our acute care system. The honourable member for Notre Dame, one final supplementary question. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Manitoba has a pool of internationally educated nurses ready to get trained, tested, and work in Manitoba's hospitals. But under this government's watch, Manitoba now has a notorious reputation for unfair barriers to credential recognition for nurses. For the past five years, the Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program has not accepted nurses. And right now, Red River College's bridging programs for nurses are sitting empty. No students are registered for fall because they know that their efforts will be useless and they have a better chance at getting their nursing licenses in other provinces, and they do. This process must be re-evaluated to make it more fair and affordable. Will the minister commit today to working with the College of Registered Nurses to modernize the process to create a fair and affordable process for internationally member, educated nurses? Order. Order. The Honourable Minister for Health and Seniors Care. As I mentioned uh, pre previously, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that uh, yes, we will work with the College of Nurses. In fact, we are working with them again to clean up uh, the mess of the previous NDP government. We'll continue to work with Shared Health. We'll continue to work with um, RHAs, post-secondary institutions, uh, nurses, and others uh, to ensure that we um, help fix this issue. The Honourable Member for Transcona. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Twice this week, I asked the Minister to protect the jobs of educational assistants. Last year, they were laid off by the thousands. On Tuesday, he suggested that EAs would still be there serving families. Now we've got word that layoffs are already beginning, including 70 at Seven Oaks starting May 21st. Will the Minister? direct the school division and protect the jobs of critical education workers in the province. The Honourable Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I do thank uh, the member opposite for that uh, question. Uh, it's very unfortunate uh, that uh, that particular school division, through their trustees, has decided to lay these, uh, these individuals off. You know, clearly we're trying to make accommodations for critical workers in schools or uh, the, the students uh, or the uh, kids or children of critical care workers. Uh, we're trying to allow uh, any special needs uh, students uh, to use those facilities as well. It's just unfortunate uh, school trustees would decide to lay these people off at this time. The Honourable Member for Transcoan on a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We're very concerned that this is just the beginning. The minister laid off thousands of critical education workers last year in the second wave. The minister said that EAs should be there to support and he promised schools should keep their EAs. But we're hearing that they already started losing their job, including the 70 that I just itemized earlier. Will he step in and direct school divisions not to lay off EAs? And will he do that today?
The Honourable Minister of Education. Well, I wonder which way the member wants it. I mean, he's talking about local choice and local voice. Now he wants us to go in there and direct school divisions what to do. Uh, the, the reality here, Mr. Speaker, we've set aside in last year's budget $185 million for COVID response. We've invested over $50 million in staffing. That's 3,500 positions that we have paid for in school divisions. The Honourable Member for Transcona on a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. For years, this Pallister government has forced unconstitutional wage freezes on thousands of the Manitoba teachers and school staff. That is wrong, and it needs to stop. Now the government is threatening school divisions and trying to force them not to bargain with teachers in the three largest school divisions in our province, River East Transcona, Winnipeg, and Lure Riel. It's time for this government to stop interfering in this. Will the minister withdraw the unconstitutional wage freeze mandate and will he ensure a fair deal for teachers in the three largest school divisions in our province? Order. The Auto Minister for Education. Well, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker. I, it's just I'm having a hard time rationalizing where the member's coming from. Uh, you know, there, there's 37 uh, school divisions. They're out there in the middle of arbitration. In fact, most of them have already settled uh, the arbitration process. I mean, we're not interfering with that. We're allowing them to do the collective bargaining process. I don't know. Now he wants us to go and intervene in that process. I'm not sure where the member's coming from. Order. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. A week ago, I wrote to the Premier and Leader of the Opposition asking for an all-party agreement to call an inquiry into allegations of harassment and even sexual assault being covered up in the Labour movement. There have been multiple allegations made over several years, and since we made our call, a number of women have reached out to us with their own stories, overwhelmed with the motion that they might have been finally been believed and they might have an opportunity for justice to be done. For speaking up, they faced retaliation and financial ruin. They do not have resources to hire a lawyer to fight for themselves. Only an independent judicial inquiry can provide the venue for investigation and justice that they seek. Will the Premier and Justice Minister call an independent judicial inquiry, or will these women have to continue to suffer in silence? The Honourable First Minister. As a government, we've been very adamant that we need to take action to address issues of, of not only workplace harassment, but harassment generally. Uh, we've initiated some of the strongest such in, uh, actions and consequences, uh, policies and administrative practices uh, to do that. Uh, we would like to continue to see support from all parties in that respect. We were disappointed, of course, in the uh, actions of the opposition when they disrespected the findings of an independent arm's length analysis of an harassment claim by one of their members. Uh, but nonetheless, would hope that going forward we could work together uh, to see uh, these issues of, of, of unsafe work environments addressed. The Honourable Member for St. Boniface on a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. There was a common thread to the stories we heard that they loved their jobs, believed in their work and their cause, but when they did the right thing, going through proper channels to report harassment or even a crime, they faced retaliation, threats, blacklisting, and job losses. Will this government call an inquiry to empower and protect women in the labor movement and make them safe? The Honourable First Minister. I again uh, would say to all members of the chamber that these issues uh, must be addressed and they must be addressed fully. We have taken uh, the actions as a government uh, to uh, move forward on anti-harassment uh, policies that we believe can uh, work if effectively supported by all parties on an ongoing basis to protect people in the workplace. Uh, we will not uh, be uh, satisfied on this side of the house until every parent, every spouse, every family member knows that their daughter or son is safe in the work environment of government. And uh, the member has raised the issue of uh, uh, concerns raised by people in the labor movement. I know those have been discarded. People have gone to the opposition leader. I know that he has refused to address these. I know also that the NDP does not have a policy to address harassment, even after it was raised repeatedly as a concern by staff within their own organization. And I would Order. encourage them 
and I would encourage all members to work together to work together as the Concordia member is now heckling. He is Order. choosing to heckle rather than listen. I am inviting him and all of our colleagues in the House to stand together and make the workplace safer for all. Order. 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 I'm standing here. When I'm standing, you're supposed to be quiet, all of you. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I've had a few ongoing conversations with women who have reached out to me over the last couple of weeks about their own personal experiences of harassment. We need to act on this now. We need to stand in solidarity and show support for all women who want to be able to come forward now and for our future. The Premier just said he won't be satisfied until we act on this. So stand in solidarity with women who have been impacted by harassment and call for an inquiry immediately. Immediately. Will this government call for that inquiry? The Honourable First Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I, I do appreciate the members raising this issue. It is a critically important issue. They're equating the solution with one thing, an inquiry. We think that support for the policies we have developed from all parties would be the first step in the direction of making a positive change. We understand that women have been harassed in the workplace, and men. And so as a government, we have dedicated ourselves not only with policies but with transparent reporting mechanisms to make sure that these things are brought to light and addressed. No one should have to endure a culture of suck it up. No one should have to be part of a, of a process whereby their, their concerns are ignored on an ongoing basis or they're told to be quiet. Regardless of the position of the person, this is why I react when the members opposite invoke parliamentary privilege as an entitlement to harass. It is not, nor should it ever be, an entitlement Order. to harass. And the members opposite who have publicly spoken out against harassment, such as the member for St. John's, such as the member for St. John's, who claims to be a supporter of the Me Too movement, claims that she is for a better, safer workplace, then act like it. Hear, hear. Order. The Honourable Member for Swan River. Yeah, Mr. Deputy Speaker, our government recently announced a $1 million investment to Order. fund activities, projects, and studies that will support the development Order. and implementation Order. of Manitoba's new provincial water management Order. strategy. Can I'm the Minister standing. of Agriculture and Resource Development inform the House what the significance of this Stop investment the, is the to our province? Stop the uh, turn off the audio. This is getting out of hand here. This, we're supposed to have a respectful workplace here too, here. I'm serious here. And the thing is, what we're, how we're conducting ourselves is, is very shameful. The Honourable Member for Swan River. Mr. Deputy Speaker, our government recently announced a $1 million investment to fund activities, projects and studies that will support the development and implementation of Manitoba's new provincial water, man or water management strategy. Can the Minister of Agriculture and Resource Development inform the House what the significance of this investment is to our province? The Honourable Minister for Agriculture and Resource Development. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank my colleague for that question. Water is a key resource for all Manitobans. We need to manage this pre precious resource sustainably as a key resource for the betterment of all Manitobans, our ecosystems, and the economy, while considering the impacts of a cl changing climate and growing economic and social needs. This new water management strategy will focus on conservation of wetlands, enhanced resiliency, improving water quality, managing nutrients, protecting biodiversity, and sustaining economic development. And I'd like to thank the Oversight Committee, led by Emily, for leading this important work for managing this critical resource for generations to come for all Manitobans. Thank you. Order. The clock is running.
The owner member for Union Station. Last fall, the Palliser government announced the closure of outpatient cancer care treatment in North Winnipeg at Concordia and Seven Oaks Hospital. It's a cut that has disrupted many people's lives. Unfortunately, this cut has impacts beyond Winnipeg. We've now learned that cancer care in Selkirk will not be accepting new patients for most of this month. The facility says it's over capacity and it physically does not have the chairs to accommodate any more patients. It's another cut to our health care system that's having real impacts on so many Manitobans. Why did this government close cancer care services in North Winnipeg? The Honourable Minister of Health and Seniors Care. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In fact, the member is just wrong. We're investing more than $25 million more this year uh, in cancer care in Manitoba. We recognize that there's much work that needs to be done. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're trying to deal with some of the challenges around that, but we'll continue to advocate and work with those who need that much necessary uh, cancer treatment in the province of Manitoba. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Union Station on a supplementary question. The closure of outpatient cancer care services at Concordia and Seven Oaks is putting too heavy a load on the remaining facilities. Selkirk is just packed. There's physically not enough chairs to accommodate patients, and the pharmacy determined that the volumes were becoming unsafe. So they've halted new patients for most of this month, and that means that folks are going to have to drive much further uh, when they're already struggling with challenges like battling cancer. Cancer care's motto is close is care close to home. Under this Palliser government, it's highway medicine and care wherever you can find it. Why? Why is this government undermining cancer care in Manitoba? The Honourable First Minister. This anniversary of my sister's passing due to cancer, I can say quite with great confidence we are not. And I can also say this is the same group of people that accused us of cutting cancer drugs to Manitobans. They were so desperate to make a political point. I'd like to uh, inform members of the House of some good news if I could. The member for Brandon West, the Minister of Central Services, announced earlier today that we are going to be expanding uh, internet services to over 125,000 underserved and unserved households in rural and northern Manitoba over the next few years. I thought that it would be good to share that news with members of the House because this is the great opportunity to equalize opportunity for rural and northern children and communities, business development and opportunities for jobs to be enhanced. I thought it was some good news that I'd like to share with the members during this global pandemic. Here. Time for question periods has expired. Petitions. The Honourable Member for Transcona. Do you have a petition? No. The Honourable Member for Union Station. No petition. The Honourable Member for Kiwaitnuk. No petition. No. Uh, the Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this petition is as follows. One, Manitoba elders and seniors built this country and province and should receive the highest level of support, having earned the right to be treated with due respect, dignity, understanding, and compassion as a fundamental human right. <clears throat> Residents of personal care homes deserve to have the best possible quality of life in their last few days, weeks, months, or years. Yet family members are regularly left angry, frustrated, disappointed, and shocked at the care their loved ones receive in Manitoba's personal care homes. Seniors who reside in personal care homes have the right to visitation by family members, especially those who provide day-to-day -day assistance in augmenting the care of their loved ones as designated family caregivers. These individuals are essential partners in care, actively and regularly participating in providing care, and may support feeding, mobility, personal hygiene, cognitive stimulation, communication, meaningful connection, relational continuity, and assistance in decision making. Legal representation, such as lawyers, powers of attorney, and healthcare proxy, should always be allowed unlimited and unobstructed access to the residents for whom they're responsible as they depend on their designated legal representative to ensure proper and adequate care and act as legal designate for care decisions on their behalf. Most personal care homes do not have enough healthcare aides to adequately provide the aforementioned basic care for seniors with high and complex levels of physical and mental issues, such as those with dementia coupled with multiple chronic conditions. Residents often require assistance in communicating their needs to overworked healthcare aides, 
and most often this is accomplished with the assistance of designated family caregivers. Because of the insufficient number of healthcare aides, especially full-time staff available to personal care home, residents often lack the most basic care, such as feeding, toileting, hydration, dental care, personal grooming, exercise, and socialization. The lack of such basic care often leads to health issues, such as periodontal disease, dehydration, urinary tract infection, sepsis, pressure ups, ulcers, bed sores, and more, which often lead to hospitalization when left unreported. Family members who advocate for improvements of such basic care can be dismissed or are met with resistance because there is not enough staff or funding to provide proper essential care. Family members who repeatedly put significant pressure on personal care home staff and management for the required basic care, according to the personal care home's own published standards, are often labeled as troublemakers and barred from entry into the home and or contact with their loved ones. Care home management will utilize the Predi Trespassers Act to justify their actions rather than improve the level of care. Under such circumstances, the additional stress and worry serves to increase the difficulty in the relationship between the resident, the family member, and the personal care home, resulting in increased tensions and fear of reprisals. Concerns related to the above situation escalate when the barred family member receives information from their loved one's basic needs are not being met, further exacerbating the issue. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows, to urge the provincial government to establish an independent nonpartisan seniors advocate to ensure that care standards are being met in all Manitoba personal care homes and to resolve disputes before harm comes to residents of personal care homes. To urge the provincial government to ensure residents of personal care homes receive adequate hands-on care to provide for their basic needs and ongoing physical care based on their individual requirements. To urge the provincial government to ensure that the mental health needs of communication and socialization of personal care home residents are met through a combination of facilitated programs, sufficient staff on hand to provide these services, and adequate access to family members, designated family caregivers, and other visitors under all reasonable circumstances. To urge the provincial government to enforce mechanisms that mandate operators to proactively and collaboratively work with designated family caregivers who augment care by ensuring they are allowed access to their loved ones under all reasonable circumstances to provide active care and support to the residents' emotional well-being, health, and quality of life. Signed by Caitlin Coates, uh, Matt Coates, Berna McDermott, uh, and many other Manitobans. Merci, Megrich. Thank you. In accordance to rule number 133-6, when petitions are read, they mu are deemed to be received by the House. The Honourable Member for Elmwood. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this petition is as follows. Number one, until recently, diagnostic medical tests, including for blood and fluid samples, were available and accessible in most medical clinics. Number two, Dynacare blood test labs have consolidated their blood and fluid testing services by closing 25 of its labs. Number three, the provincial government has cut diagnostic testing at many clinic sites and residents now have to travel to different locations to get their testing done, even for a simple blood test or urine sample. Number four, Further, travel challenges for vulnerable and elderly residents of Northeast Winnipeg may result in fewer tests being done or delays in testing with the attendant effects of increased health care costs and poorer individual patient outcomes. Number five, COVID-19 emergency rules have resulted in long outdoor lineups, putting vulnerable residents at further risk in extreme weather, be it, be it hot or cold. Moreover, these long lineups have resulted in longer wait times for services and poor service in general. Number six, Manitoba residents value the convenience and efficiency of the healthcare system when they're able to give their samples at the time of the doctor visit. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows, to urge the provincial government to immediately demand Dynacare maintain all of the phlebotomy blood sample sites existing prior to the COVID-19 public health emergency and allow all Manitobans to get their blood and urine tests done when visiting their doctor. 
thereby facilitating local access to blood testing services. And this petition is signed by many Manitobans. Any further petitions, grievances? Orders of the day, government business, the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could you please resolve into Committee of Supply? It has been announced that we're going to be resolving into the Committee of Supplies. Mr. Deputy Speaker, please take the chair.
Uh, Mr. Chair, I just uh, was told to let you know that I'm here. I just wanted to know if you could hear me. Yeah, Minister, we can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, perfect. The opposition is ready to start, so we'll get going here. Will the committee, will the committee of supplies please come to order? This section of committee of supply is now considered the estimates for the Department of Health and Seniors Care. Does the honourable minister have an opening statement? The honourable minister of health. I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And uh, before I begin, I want to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Brent Rusin, as well as my congratulations on his receiving the Physician of the Year Award from Doctors Manitoba. I'd also like to thank Dr. Jazz Atwell, uh, Dr. Joss Reimer and Johanna Bota and the many leaders and members of Manitoba's COVID-19 response team, uh, Manitoba's Vaccine Implementation Task Force and the First Nations Pandemic Response Coordination Team. Uh, thank you all for your incredible leadership, your guidance, uh, your dedication, your commitment and compassion you have shown your fellow Manitobans during uh, the pandemic. To our doctors, nurses, healthcare aides, pharmacists, and countless other healthcare professionals, we know this has been one of the most difficult years of your career, and we thank you for everything that you have done. Manitobans are truly grateful for your heroic efforts you have displayed and the remarkable courage and perseverance that you have shown in the face of incredible challenges. A special thank you to Deputy Minister Karen Hurt and our Assistant Deputy Ministers and the departmental staff of Manitoba Health and Seniors Care. Manitobans certainly recognize and appreciate uh, the hard work and, and long hours you have put in to keep Manitobans safe this year. So thank you to the staff. I also want to thank uh, my own staff, both political and my front office staff, uh, day in and day out when I arrive and when I leave in the early mornings and the late evenings uh, they're here to to help uh, serve all manitobans and i just want to thank them uh, for everything that they have done i'd also like to take some time to put on the record some of the work being done by this government to help fight covid 19 and to protect and to help protect manitobans in the largest vaccination campaign ever seen in manitoba history as of today, we have administered 605,555 doses in Manitoba, representing 48.1% of our population over the age of 18. Expanded, we have expanded the vaccine eligibility to all Manitobans age 18 and older. 14 pop-up clinics are running this week, vaccinating Manitobans closer to their home communities with dozens of clinics running each month. We've introduced Manitoba's paid sick leave program, providing direct financial assistance to Manitobans having to take time off work due to COVID-19. Seven vaccination super sites are now up and running with two in Winnipeg and a site in Morden, Brandon, Selkirk, Thompson, and Dauphin, and soon to be uh, Gimli as well. Working at these sites are over 3,000 staff helping vaccinate thousands of Manitobans every day of the week. Initially, we initially pri prioritized uh, those most at risk in our province for vaccination, our health care employees, Indigenous people, personal care home residents, uh, police officers and first responders. We also focused on geographic areas of concern. In Winnipeg, we focus these areas in the area of River, Height, River East South, uh, St. Vitale North, Seven Oaks East, Inkster West, Bordery South, Point Douglas North, Downtown West, Downtown East, Inkster East, Point, Point Douglas South, Seven Oaks West, uh, in the, and in the areas of the Interlake um, Eastern Regional Health Authority, Power View, Pine Falls, in Brandon, Brandon East End, and Brandon Downtown, and all those living or working in the Northern Regional Health Authority. We partnered with almost uh, 500 doctor's offices and pharmacies to vaccinate Manitobans in their communities. We partnered with five urban Indigenous community organizations in Manitoba to create Indigenous-led 
immunization clinics, three of which are open in Winnipeg, uh, Brandon and Portage to help vaccinate at risk uh, urban populations as well as our homeless populations. Our focused in immunization teams uh, have visited every personal care home in Manitoba to vaccinate 96% of residents. We've implemented the FastPass pilot program, which offers dedicated asymptomatic testing to teachers, educational support staff, licensed child care centers, nursery schools, and family group child care homes. We partnered with North Dakota to ensure that up to 4,000 essential truck drivers will be vaccinated, allowing Manitoba's economy to keep moving. We partnered with Manitoba businesses and critical services to launch a COVID-19 rapid testing a screening program that helps limit the spread of COVID-19 through early detection and screening. We've frozen the Pharmacare deductible to help provide COVID relief to Manitobans. We're working collaboratively with 63 First Nations and 50 Northern Affairs communities in partnership with the Manitoba First Nations COVID-19 Pandemic Response Coordination Team. We've created a team to implement all 17 recommendations of the Stevenson Report to strengthen the long-term care sector in Manitoba. This is only a brief snapshot of the work being done, but we recognize that there is still more work to be done. On behalf of the Department of Health and Seniors Care, I'm very pleased to present the financial estimates for the 2021-22 fiscal year. In doing so, I commit to Manitobans that through this budget, we will continue to deliver high quality health care in an innovative and sustainable manner. We will continue to deliver safe and accessible services and continue to maximize health outcomes for Manitobans at large. As the, new sup uh, as the new supplement describes, we will continue to strive for optimal performance in the, department and the, in the department and the health system with dedicated focus on results in the, fall in the, er in the areas of improving access, improving health service experience, improving patient safety, ensuring affordability and health system spending. The proposed 2021-22 health budget in core represents the largest investment in healthcare in our history, just over $6 billion as it resides today. More specifically, the newly reconfigured Department of Health and Seniors Care was created on January 2021, in January, sorry, 2021, and now reflects a 2021-22 expenditure in core of $6 billion, 40, of $6 billion $49 million and 713.75 uh, FTEs. This represents an $81 million increase from the restated 2021 budget or a 1.4% increase. In terms of summary, the 2021 health sector summary budget is set at 6.62 billion, representing an overall increase of 2.3% for health and seniors care. I should note as well that on the topic of COVID-19, that our government has proactively budgeted for and set aside amounts in respect to pressures from COVID-19. The onset of this international pandemic represents an exceptional challenge to Manitobans and therefore an exceptional amount of funds has been earmarked for the health sector response. Our government has established an amount of $1.18 billion in 2021-22 for COVID-19 response and other contingencies uh, as an internal service adjustment within enabling appropriations for which health and seniors care will have access. The use of this funding has and will include some of the following an increase in Manitoba's lab testing capacity for both system, symptomatic and asymptomatic cases in laboratory and other select environments, bolstering Manitoba's surveillance and contact tracing capacity to be able to track and trace the spread of the pandemic and be able to communicate results in a timely manner, procurement of personal protective equipment to help keep our healthcare workers safe in the course of care, Establishment and oper operationalization of COVID visitation shelters, allowing for families and residents of personal care homes to visit in a safe and socially distanced manner. Expansion of inpatient capacity, including, but not limited,
committed to critical care, where we project additional needs will present in the weeks and months to come. And last but not least, the establishment of both super site and pop-up site locations across Manitoba for the timely delivery of COVID-19 vaccinations. Budget 2021 includes a number of key investments and enhancements in the delivery of health services. I'll now take a few minutes to describe these investments. Manitoba Health and Seniors Care takes the fiscal imperative of this government very seriously. This means weighing carefully our options that maximize patient outcomes and quality of care, along with protecting the sustainability of the healthcare system. The minister's time is, uh, ex has expired. Thanks for, I, 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 does, um, I wanna thank the uh, minister for her comments. Does the official opposition critic have any opening comments? The honorable um, member for Union Station. Um, I'd like to start my comments today um, echoing and restating some of the thanks that the minister has already put on the record. I'd like to thank Dr. Rusin, Dr. Reimer, Dr. Atwell, uh, Lynette Siracusa, Dr. Anderson, Anderson, and all of the health leaders and expertise that have helped guide us throughout this pandemic and who have truly um, shown up consistently and been very visible and vocal in a way that I know alleviates many of the anxieties that folks in our communities are facing. Uh, their health leadership is, is undeniably um, a huge source of us being able to get through this pandemic um, you know, as well as we possibly can, and we thank them for their ongoing efforts. I'd like to specifically acknowledge and thank the efforts of the First Nations Pandemic Response Team, the Vaccination Task Force as well, civil servants who've all been contributing throughout this pandemic and working uh, like never before to help us navigate this global pandemic. I'd like to thank healthcare workers across the board for their ongoing efforts in the midst of uh, increasing stressors in this third wave, continuing to show up day in and day out for Manitobans. And I'd like to thank those working in community health who often have filled the gaps in healthcare where folks may have otherwise uh, not had their healthcare needs met in, in what have been very tumultuous and in moments uncertain times during this pandemic. Um, you know, I, I recognize that yesterday was a significant day for Manitobans where we did see, unfortunately, uh, 1,000 COVID-related deaths. And I'd like to restate my condolences on behalf of our caucus to all of those families who are dealing with the loss of loved ones. And today we, we see a new record established around uh, COVID cases, 560 cases today. Uh, certainly, you know, the pandemic has been challenging and these new numbers are, are challenging, absolutely. But certainly the pandemic has allowed us to also see some of the best of Manitoba. Uh, many folks showing so much resiliency and care and creativity and compassion for their fellow Manitobans. It, it's incredible to see the way folks have rallied uh, around one another, around their neighbors, their loved ones, their friends, and even complete strangers. Uh, the reality is that COVID-19 has changed our province, it's changed our country, and it's changed our world. It's laid bare the flaws in our society as well and our challenges in taking collective, progressive and necessary action. It's also exposed challenges within our healthcare system. That is especially true here in Manitoba where the last few years, five years uh, of cutbacks under this conservative government and consolidation left Manitoba particularly unprepared for this pandemic. Our front lines in this battle have taken heroic steps, heroic steps in fighting this pandemic. It's Nurse Appreciation Week this week. It's also Allied Health Professionals Week. And we owe nurses and all healthcare professionals, Allied Health Professionals, uh, so much thanks. Uh, we owe them so much more than that as they face down this virus from beginning to this point and moving forward. Those folks need a, a partner in government that matches their commitment. You know, unfortunately, instead, in the years leading up to this public health emergency, capacity was cut in our health system. Critical care was cut, nurses were fired, emergency rooms consolidated. Right at the beginning of this pandemic, as we're all aware now, there were less intensive care beds in Winnipeg than there were, there were 
in 2017. And the positions that staff uh, in intensive care units, the staff positions rather in intensive care units have never actually been adequately or properly staffed up. We've been hearing a lot recently from the Minister of Health about positions that will be staffed up. Um, however, unfortunately, the intensive care units have never actually been adequately staffed up over the past few years. And that put our critical care units at a huge disadvantage when it comes to fighting this, this terrible virus. Uh, I wish I could tell this house that uh, COVID-19 was the only challenge facing our healthcare system, uh, but I think I've, I've already made it abundantly clear that unfortunately that's just not the case. There are several other issues that face us and that we're dealing with. Uh, rural and northern healthcare continues to face real challenges. The minister uh, very recently closed the Altona emergency room. I've heard from a number of folks in that community, uh, their concerns around that and the, the detrimental impacts that's having. And uh, facilities across Manitoba have nurse vacancy rates of over 20% and even more than that in, in some cases. Uh, in addition to all of these concerns that I've already laid out, my colleague, the Honourable Member for Point Douglas, will spend some time inquiring of the government regarding the very, very serious addictions crisis that we're facing in this province. A crisis of unmet mental health needs, a crisis of unaddressed and unmet uh, childhood trauma-based needs, um, all areas of concerns. And the fact that the addiction support the government has put forward are wholly inadequate. They're just completely inadequate to deal with the crisis that's at hand. It can't, you can't call it a problem at hand. It's truly a full-fledged crisis that we're seeing. So uh, lastly, I'd like to thank all of the staff here in the legislature who have really done incredibly exceptional work. They do that on a regular basis, but certainly throughout this pandemic and making sure that we can still continue to do our jobs and bring these issues forward and you know, represent our constituents. The folks who are supporting today's proceedings are also facing their own challenges in this pandemic and have continued day in and day out to show up and be kind and be energetic and be supportive. And uh, it's just a testament to the quality of character of the folks who work here and their commitment to Manitobans. So I want to express my thanks, especially to them as well. I'll just leave my remarks there. We thank the critic for the official opposition for those comp remarks. Under the Manitoba practice, the bait of the minister's salary is the last item considered in the Department of the Committee of Supply. According, accordingly, we shall now re defer uh, consideration for line number 21.1A contained in resolution 21.1. At this time, we invite ministerial and opposition staff to enter the chamber or their office. Could the minister uh, and, um, introduce the staff in attendance? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I have with me today Karen Hurd, my Deputy Minister, as well as Dan Swarchuk, who is the uh, Assistant Deputy Minister responsible for um, administration and finance. We thank the Minister for introducing their, her, her staff. Does the critic have a staff member you want to, want to introduce? I do. I have with me today. Um, uh, member for Union Station, sorry. Thank you. I have with me today uh, staff member Chris Sanderson. Okay, thank you. Does the committee want to proceed through the, the estimates of this? Department? Mr. Chair. Yes, the Honourable uh, Minister. Pardon me, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just having some difficulties hearing you. I've okay. got everything up to max on my. Okay, just one second. I'll move system. my mic. Oh, that's better. Is but... that better? Okay. Plus, I'll have a mask. Thank you. <laughs> okay, can you hear me better? Okay. Um, does the committee want to proceed with through the estimates of this department chronolog chronologically or through a global discussion? Global? Is it, a, is it approval to, of the minister's department? Agreed to uh, a global sure. committee? As globally? Yeah, I order. don't have a... 
Yeah, I don't have a problem with that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, I just the, want the to ask. Minister. Oh. Sorry. So you have to acknowledge me, I guess. Yeah, the, the honourable minister. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. And yeah, I don't have a problem with going globally. I think, um, and I will speak to the member uh, maybe after if we could coordinate um, just on some of the topics that we might be um, looking at on a daily basis that might be helpful from a staffing standpoint. So I'm wondering if they are open for that approach. Yeah, that's we'll go globally, but under the understanding that um, making sure that you have the right staff each day um, based on the, the critic, okay? Is that, is that agreed for the committee? Been agreed, it's so ordered. But thank you, uh, it's agreed that the question for the department will be proceeded on a global matter based on the on a day-by-day -day basis with all resolutions to be passed once questioning has been concluded. The floor is open for questions. The honour member for Union Station. I'd like to um, ask the minister some questions around um, labs and I'm, I'm glad that the minister did articulate in her opening comments about um, some budgets, uh, funding that would be allocated toward increasing lab testing capacity. So I'm, I'm wondering if the minister can share with me how much of the current COVID-19 PCR testing is being done through CADM labs and how much is being done through Dynacare? I just wanted to make, make sure that um, when we do these questions, the minister, if you can just put up your hand when you're ready to answer the questions so that I can um, identif identify you then after. The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and I uh, just want to thank the, the member for the question. So there's three areas um, who do testing in in uh, labs in Manitoba. So we use CADM Labs, 
Uh, Shared Health also does some testing as well as uh, our community partner, um, Dynacare. Uh, so originally, we obviously started out when COVID started um, to use, uh, you know, current capacity that we have uh, within our system um, and uh, that we run and manage. And so that would be CADM and then obviously shared health. Um, it was, you know, obviously very quickly we needed to uh, increase capacity. So we look to increase that capacity further um, by uh, reaching out to our community lab partner, uh, Dynacare. Um, so uh, it's roughly around 50-50 in terms of what is managed uh, sort of internally versus the utilization of our community lab partner uh, as well. But we'll see just even uh, as of today where we had a record number of uh, the number of tests that were uh, administered in the province of over 4,700. Um, you can see that we just simply would not have the capacity to do all of that internally. And it's obviously very important that we get uh, the lab test done and the results out to uh, to those individuals. Um, so we just want to thank uh, obviously everyone working in CADM and in Sh Shared Health uh, for all the uh, work that they do and also to our community uh, lab partners in, in Dynacare. The honor member for Union Station. Uh, thank you, Minister, for that, for that answer. Um, can the Minister share if PCR tests are being done through Dynacare in Winnipeg or are some or all of them being shipped out of pro out of province rather for processing? The Honour Minister. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and, and again, thank the member for the question. And um, of course, uh, you know, as many PCR tests that we can get done in the province of Manitoba, we will, and through our partners, uh, that does take place from time to time. It's obviously the most important thing that we get um, the tests completed um, as quickly as possible to get those results back to those individuals. Um, so we can uh, start our contact tracing and so on. And so from time to time, um, you know, our, our community lab partner will, um, you know, uh, administer some of those uh, PCR tests uh, through um, other labs outside of Manitoba. But that's just to ensure that they can deliver on, on a most efficient and effective uh, way for, um, for our citizens here that they get, that they're able to get uh, the results on a more expedited fashion. The honour member for Union Station. I'd like to thank the minister for that answer. I'm wondering if uh, the minister can provide some clarity on that percentage. So I know she said from time to time, but do you, does the minister have uh, information concretely in terms of what percentage are therefore being done uh, through Dynacare in Winnipeg versus the ones that are being shipped out of pro pro province uh, for processing?
the Honourable Minister. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and again, thank the member uh, for the question. And I think it it, it very much varies uh, from time to time as to how much is being administered uh, here versus uh, out of province. I will say in the initial stages, I'm told that um, initially as things started to ramp up in terms of the number of testing uh, that took number of tests that were uh, administered uh, at the at the beginning sort of days of the pandemic, um, more were going outside of province. Um, and then, you know, sort of as we got through this, as as our community partner um, started to increase um, equipment and so on in the province of Manitoba, that has increased steadily. And so, so it has varied over time, but there is sort of more taking place locally now than maybe was uh, originally in some of the, you know, the higher volume uh, days that took place in, in the early days of, uh, of the pandemic. The honourable member for Union Station. I thank the minister for that uh, for that clarification. Um, it's interesting because I think what the minister has identified is that as as Dynacare increased their capacity as a lab, they less and less so needed to have uh, tests processed out of province. They were able to actually do that locally in Winnipeg. Um, and so that, that does lead me to wonder why capacity has not been wrapped up at the CADM labs in order for them to do this testing. If, if we can see that uh, Dynacare in, increasing their capacity has led to uh, you know, these tests being processed here, why was capacity not ramped up at CADM labs uh, to do this very testing? Yeah, do you know, oh, sorry. Mr. Chair. Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, and, th and thank the member for the question. No, I don't want to uh, leave the member with the um, with with that uh, that information because it wouldn't be accurate. Um, the uh, there has been um, an increase uh, significantly in the number of um, um, lab tests that were done at CADM as well. Um, so that, that wouldn't be accurate uh, in terms of the way the member put it. So I just want to make sure that we correct that. Um, I do want to just say as well uh, and thank our CADM team uh, for the incredible work that they do. I know that they've been re recognized with, I think it was a, a Medal of Excellence or whatnot from uh, Doctors Manitoba, really recognizing the incredible work that the CADM team does. And so I would be remiss not to also uh, mention that and, and thank them. Um, uh, for everything they do and, and congratulate them for the incredible work that they've done. The Honourable Member for Union Station. Thank you for that and thank the Minister. I would echo uh, the Minister's sentiments about CADM Labs. Uh, that's certainly an important acknowledgement of how hard they've been working and what they've been able to do during this pandemic. Um, so I, I do kind of have another question around capacity here, specifically around CADM. We do know that recently uh, variant testing, so variants of concern, testing specifically for those uh, were outsourced to Dynacare. So not just the PCR tests, but the, uh, the variants of concerns are being processed uh, via that, that contract, uh, which we don't have details around with Dynacare. So I'm, I'm wondering again, when we're looking at capacity, especially long-term, the minister has identified that um, they are going to be allocating some of that 1.1 a $1.18 billion um, specific to addressing needs more long-term. Um, could capacity not be enhanced at CADM to be able to do some of this? Um, again, referencing the fact that they've now outsourced variant testing to Dynacare.
the Honourable Minister. I just thank the member. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank the member um, for the question again. I, I think it's important to know and understand that various measures have taken place over the course of the last number of months to increase um, the capacity at CADM labs and, and also not just for the um, regular testing, but also for the variants of concern as well. And so um, we'll continue to find ways to, uh, to expand the capacity as well. And that's certainly all a part of the plan. The honourable member for Union Station. Uh, thank the minister for that answer. So the, the minister has kind of touched on something um, that I think is really important to clarify in terms of what the plans are for CADM labs. Um, the minister has just said that work is being done to um, enhance their capacity at CADM, including for testing uh, for variants of concern. That's a good thing. Um, can the minister expand and, and sort of articulate very clearly what the plan actually is for CADM labs? Is the government considering divesting uh, its labs, divesting from CADM labs in any or all capacity? Or um, is the minister considering forms of a, a public-private partnership? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, thanks. Uh, I want to thank the member for the question. And, and certainly, um, as, as is the case all across the country and other provinces, um, there's always going to be a need for a public health lab. So that is not changing here. Um, what we are seeing is, in, and, and it was recommended, that we move um, and consolidate some of our um, lab uh, capacity um, under shared health. So it's really just more of a coordination effort. There will always be um, that need for a, for a public health lab. So that is, that is not changing. The Honourable Member for Union Station. I suppose I'm, I'm wondering if the uh, Minister could expand then uh, in terms of what's going on with um, the private partnership. Uh, certainly, I don't think you find very many people at all who would disagree with the fact that we should have public labs. We need that. Uh, certainly, with some of the changes that have happened in the last few years, we've actually seen with the shift in diagnostics and the consolidation of, of, um, of labs and access to labs that it, many folks in communities have had a challenging time accessing what they need. Uh, certainly, this pandemic has exposed the realities of what happens when some of those choices are made. Um, seniors waiting in line for tests for hours and hours and hours, uh, situations where parents 
are, are putting their children who are already toileted, having to put them in diapers uh, because they're waiting so long that they can't leave to go use the washroom. Um, you know, other challenges with folks accessing uh, labs just for general blood work and things of this nature. I, I, I'm sure the minister is aware because we've written uh, to the minister's office on these issues, as I know many Manitobans have. And so specifically, it, can the minister outline what the actual plan is for CADM Lab? It's one thing to say, we know there needs to be public uh, labs and, and, and diagnostics. It's another thing to be able to outline what the plan is for CADM Labs, which I'm sure the minister, uh, the minister's office, they're making plans around, you know, throughout and beyond this pandemic. So can the minister provide some clarity around what the actual plan is for CADM Lab? And, and also the, the other part of my question that wasn't answered previously, um, you know, is the minister considering forms of public-private partnership and what's that going to look like? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank the member for the question. And, uh, you know, we've already started to increase uh, capacity at, at CADM Labs, and uh, we will continue to do so. And that's where some of these monies uh, will be focused. Um, so uh, that is the plan for CADM Labs is to, is to um, increase the, the capacity. The Honourable Member for Union Station. Forms of public-private partnership for labs. S sorry, Mr. Chair, I didn't hear the question. Yeah, sorry, uh, the honourable member for Union Station, can you repeat that question? Of course. Uh, is the minister considering forms of public-private partnership for labs? I mean, again, areas the, the of Honourable procurement. Uh, oh, sorry, Mr. The Chair. Minister. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, er areas of procurement are done under central services, but we certainly have uh, no plans um, to move forward with public private partnerships with our labs. The Honourable Member for Union Station. To thank the Minister for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Uh, so just some questions around uh, long-term care. This, this year's budget says that long-term care is seeing a price and a volume increase. Can the minister explain that in more detail? Uh, what comes to mind for me automatically, certainly after um, the devastating impacts uh, COVID-19 had in long-term care and, and some of those outcomes, unfortunately, I'm thinking about staffing that comes to mind amongst many other things, but we do know that that was an issue um, throughout this pandemic. And so I'm just wondering if the minister can explain in more detail um, what, what that means, the price and volume increase, and if any of that is, is talking specifically about staffing.
the honourable minister. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just to address the, the price and, and volume increases, um, maybe I'll start with volume first. Uh, volume is increasing because we're increasing the capacity of um, the number of beds, um, personal care homes. So uh, we're increasing in this budget uh, 120 uh, beds that are going to be added to um, Boeing Lodge, uh, which is in Carmen, Manitoba, and Rest Haven, which is in, um, in Steinbeck. Uh, so that's increasing the capacity of our personal care homes. And when it comes to pricing, um, obviously some of the, the challenges, you know, there's inflationary incre increases, but I know one of the things that we're hearing um, from our RHAs and that they've noticed is obviously a significant price increase and in, um, some of the, uh, you know, the, the medications, the drugs that are used by, um, by those uh, living in our, our long-term care facilities. And so I think that's what's really important here. And this is where we've, as a government and our, our premier has been very vocal on um, needing to work with the federal government to ensure that they understand um, these, these pricing uh, increases uh, that are not just affecting us here in Manitoba, but it's all across the country. And so we really need a pan-Canadian approach to, to dealing um, with the ever increasing uh, cost to healthcare. And that's, that's where it's gonna be very important uh, moving forward to have the support of, I think all MLAs um, in terms of, you know, uh, for, for Manitoba um, to call on the federal government to appropriately um, fund uh, healthcare um, across the country. The Honourable Member for Union Station. Can the minister maybe provide a bit more information, a bit more detail around how much a Winnipeg PCH might expect in percentage terms this year? Um, I, I can certainly appreciate uh, what the minister, you know, spoke to in terms of some of those hard numbers might be really, really tough to nail down uh, based on other variables, but uh, certainly PCHs are, uh, you know, dealing with, with COVID and rising costs and challenges that will continue down the road. And um, in seeing a, a description like that increase in price and volume, they would certainly be wondering, what does that mean actually in terms of percentage and dollars? So can the minister clarify just what might a, a Winnipeg personal care home expect in terms of percentage this year? And, uh, and what is that actually for?
the owner minister. Yeah, I just I don't think we have that level of detail here with us right now today, but certainly we could endeavor to to get that uh, that information to the member. The honor member for Union Station. Thank you. I, I would appreciate that very much. Um, so just, you know, in regards to funding for PCHs, it's interesting because one of the recommendations, I believe it's recommendation 15 uh, of Dr. Stevenson's review was regarding funding for long-term care, identifying that funding for long-term care needed to be uh, much more of what, than what it is, it needs to be substantial. Um, that has been, you know, echoed across the board from every association, organization, community member, families, be more funding in long-term care. Yet, in this budget, that funding is essentially flat. Like that funding, anybody can look at that and, and see the funding is just insufficient. It's inadequate. Uh, and especially given the time that we're still in and what is in front of us in the very, right now, near future, down the road for long-term care, um, that to me is incredibly concerning and it's a, just a huge miss. I don't think anybody, I know I certainly did not expect to see flat funding for personal care homes, long-term care in Manitoba, given the devastating tragedies that we saw uh, during this pandemic. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna shift from that because I, I, I just think ultimately, you know, it's, it's a huge, huge miss on the part of this government. Uh, I would implore the minister to, to advocate on this, uh, you know, very assertively to not let long-term care, personal care homes, uh, all those folks who have suffered during this pandemic due to the devastating outcomes that we saw, not disappoint those folks further and ensure that we've got the funding that's necessary in long-term care here in Manitoba. Um, I, I'm gonna specifically ask about uh, something that we did advocate for uh, when we saw those early signs of, of transmission in, in long-term care homes, specifically around inspections. I'm wondering if the minister can share if there's been an increase in inspections in long-term care facilities since the pandemic began. Um, so not, not um, I guess I'll just, yeah, specifically to since the pandemic began, has there been an increase in inspections for long-term care facilities?
the Honorable Minister. Thanks very much. Uh, just a couple of things to talk about with respect to um, the member's question. Um, certainly, I, I, I think it, um, it's probably worth explaining that the, the price and volume um, in the personal care home, the line sort of in the budget, um, you know, is just a part of the investments that are made in personal care homes in the province. Uh, that does not include all investments made in personal care homes. And so I think it's important to, to know and understand that certainly in the last year, um, we've expended over $205 million in COVID-related costs um, that has gone directly into personal care homes. Uh, we also um, have, uh, there was also $280 million uh, that went towards uh, life safety um, initiatives within personal care homes as well. So that would be like sprinkler systems and, and so on and those significant life-saving um, upgrades to, because um, we do know that we inherited um, you know, really what uh, was very uh, old facilities in the province of Manitoba that uh, in many cases, you know, we needed to, to move on those life saving uh, and life safety initiatives to ensure the safety of all those residents, um, you know, so fire code things and, and things of that nature. So those are significant, just a couple of examples of fairly significant investments that we put into um, you know, our, our personal care home area. Uh, but the member, I believe, asked in the end about a, a review of, of personal care homes. And um, just this past year, uh, we, we did something that has never been done before, where we did a review of all 125 personal care homes uh, in the province of Manitoba. Um, before it was done sort of cyclically, um, and that was sort of established under the, the previous government, and, and we changed that to ensure that uh, just this past year, we did a, a review of, of all of those personal care homes. And uh, I believe that review is coming out sometime soon. Uh, we can get the, the exact date on that, but certainly, um, you know, we're very committed to, um, and I've said publicly several times to um, the implementing the recommendations of the Stevenson report. And so we will continue to, uh, to ensure that we do that. Um, we just went public with our 60-day update or 90 days since uh, the beginning of, uh, of this, which we committed to, and we will continue to update the public every 90 days on the progress made there. And so, um, you know, I think, uh, I think we're moving uh, in the right direction. We recognize there's, there's work to be done, and uh, we're committed to ensuring that that work gets done. The Honourable Member for Union Station. I'd like to thank the Minister for providing some more clarification on, on those points. Um, I will say that the funding that she's referring to, the additional investment she's referring to, the $280 million, um, you know, that's, that's for basic work that should be done um, anyhow. That's for renovations and work that should be done uh, regardless of whatever situation we're, we're in in this province, pandemic or otherwise and that the funds that were allocated to long-term care homes during this pandemic um, should have been allocated to long-term care homes during this pandemic. They, they needed those resources. They were going above and beyond doing what they can to try and keep residents safe uh, and, and access the resources that they needed in order to uh, navigate this pandemic. Uh, certainly wasn't rolled out in a manner that uh, many of those uh, working in long-term care, running long-term care homes, uh, found to be uh, timely in order to support those needs. Uh, but specifically, you know, I'm referring to future investments, investments right now that we know this government, the minister, are, are falling short on. Funding is flat. That doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make any sense to anybody I've talked to. I've talked to many people about this matter uh, in particular. It's something that is near and dear, I would say, to Manitobans across the board. Manitobans of all uh, backgrounds, um, all, all political leanings are, are unified in identifying that long-term care, personal care homes need substantial funding. That needs to be addressed, and this budget doesn't do it, and that's unacceptable. Uh, I don't know how many more lessons need to be learned in regards to what happens when we don't. And so to me, it's, it's just there's, there's no rhyme or reason that can be provided to justify that uh, that failure in terms of lack of funding for long-term care, 
And, I, and again, I would implore the minister to address that. Uh, it needs to be addressed immediately. It's something that, again, uh, you know, folks across the board understand to be necessary. Now, my, my previous question was specific to inspections in long-term care facilities and, and whether or not uh, there's been an increase since the pandemic started. So while I appreciate the minister uh, providing the response that she did, I'd like clarification in regards to if the inspections, the frequency, the amount have increased. And I'd actually, it would be great to know what the plan is for inspections for long-term care homes. Is there a plan to increase the frequency moving forward to increase the inspections that are being done you know, in the future? And will those inspections uh, and the reporting on them be made public and accessible?
the honorable minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So, so just going back, um, just uh, sort of paint a picture here that the regular um, standard review that that had taken place sort of prior to last year, um, we were up to speed with all of those uh, regular reviews. Uh, I think in light of what was happening last year during COVID, the decision was made to expand those reviews to all 125 personal care homes in the province um, so that, you know, we could see, uh, you know, uh, obviously what was going on, you know, across the country and so on. So we expanded that uh, review to include all personal care homes in the province of Manitoba. Moving forward, we are going to continue with those reviews uh, as of this year as well. We're not going to decrease the number of reviews that are taking place. Uh, we obviously recognize the value of, of doing these reviews and what we learn um, from those reviews. Um, as we have gone through uh, these reviews um, for the first time, in, I think, in the history, um, we have been making these reviews public, uh, so they are available online. And as we continue to move forward, um, the member will be able to, to see the results of those uh, reviews moving forward. But certainly, um, you know, we want to be able to learn from these. And as we learn more from these reviews, it will also uh, sort of uh, help us to develop a very robust plan uh, moving forward beyond this year as to how often um, uh, and as to what that review process uh, will be moving forward. So we're still in that exploratory phase, um, but I will say that doing the 100 to all 125 reviews last year, committed to doing those this year, and then obviously developing a plan based on what we've learned from there uh, moving forward. So uh, that's, that's the plan. The Honourable Member for Union Station. I'd like to thank the, the minister for that clarification. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, I'd like to ask about the uh, commitment that the minister made to implementing the recommendations of Maple's long-term care home review. Um, the minister just just uh, touched on that, saying that uh, a report was was posted online. The report is available. I'm just wondering if the minister can identify for us. Um, you know, where they're at in terms of, of implementing some of the recommendations um, that were made. I, like I said, I, I know the report uh, is available now um, based on that and, and that she committed to doing so. But in terms of some of the implement, in, implementation, can the minister identify where some of that is at? I've already talked about recommendation 15, where I think this government has fallen way, way short in terms of the substantial funding recommendation that was made by Dr. Stevenson, but I'm wondering if the minister can talk about the other uh, recommendations and implementation. The Honourable Minister. 
So what I will say to the minister is, um, I believe we just posted, I think it was last week, it may have been the week uh, before, uh, forgive me, my uh, my my weeks are uh, jumbling together here, but um, that w they, we did post uh, um, the review of where we're at uh, in terms of all of the, the recommendations. Um, so the update of those recommendations and, and uh, um, uh, you know, in terms of where we're at with that. So we've taken an approach and in those, um, and in that review and what is posted online, um, the member opposite will note that we've taken an approach where we've looked at sort of the whole of Manitoba approach, because of course we have committed to implementing uh, the 17 recommendations, obviously not just in Maples, but um, in all 125 personal care homes across the province of Manitoba. So we've given, um, you know, an update in terms of where we're at implementing it uh, in a broad uh, range across um, personal care homes across Manitoba. But we've also um, pointed out uh, there is a section in there that focuses directly on Maple's personal care home itself to see where we're at in terms of the implementation of those seven, 17 recommendations within um, Maples itself. And, you know, in terms of um, those who are doing this review, we have a very, you know, broad section of uh, people, you know, who are working either in the RHAs, the personal care homes, um, department staff, staff from the personal care homes. There's a wide range of individuals who um, are, are helping to, to implement this as well. And so, I just wanted to thank them actually at this time and, and take this opportunity because um, we gave them some pretty um, pretty aggressive uh, timeframes to implement this in, and uh, you know they they have delivered on that, and uh, we you know it was very important to, to me and our government that we're as transparent um, as we can throughout this process, and that we wanted to put this uh, make sure this goes online for people to be able to access and and to see as well. The honour member for Union Station. Uh, thank the minister for that response, and you know, it's. I'm glad the minister is talking about Maple's personal care home. Um, obviously, we all know the devastating um, deaths that happened at Maple's personal care home. We're all aware of the fact that it was a paramedic who posted on Reddit uh, the circumstances that they attended to at Maple's personal care home, um, which resulted in, in actions being taken. Uh, but I, I do reflect on the government's own briefing notes before this tragedy on the 6th of November happened at Maple's personal care home. I, I recall and I reflect the government briefing note from November the 3rd, which actually described the situation at Maple's as stabilizing, the staffing situation as stabilizing, which you know, anybody who has any, I mean, you, you have to know, based on the events that took place just days later, um, that, that that doesn't add up. And so I'm wondering if the minister can shed some light on that. How, do, how does this happen? Because that's still something that we actually, we didn't get that answer from Dr. Stevenson's report, that very important question that everybody was expecting an answer to. How did this happen? How, how does a personal care home be inspected and, and, and government briefing notes say the, the staffing situation, the situation there is stabilizing, when in fact, what was going on there wasn't stabilizing and the situation was nightmarish and had heartbreaking outcomes as a result. So, just wondering if the minister can shed some light on that, because to this point, no one has taken responsibility for that. No one has, no one, not in, the, not in Dr. Stevenson's report, no one has been able to come forward, be accountable and say, staffing wasn't where it should be, wasn't stabilized, and this is the reason why, and we take responsibility and accountability for that. And that is something that is a huge component of moving forward and implementing any recommendations is that piece and it's missing. So can the minister please shed some light on that?
the honorable minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and you know I thank the the member for the question. Of course, um, I, I believe that uh, you know the department at the time did recognize there were some challenges, uh, obviously, and uh, took very very prompt action um, to uh, to hire uh, get an independent uh, person, uh, Lynn, Dr. Lynn Stevenson, involved to do an independent review. Uh, of what transpired at uh, Maple's personal care home. And obviously that resulted in the 17 recommendations which we have uh, agreed to implement. Um, the member opposite is getting into uh, details that are right now before the courts. Uh, the member opposite will know that there is a class action lawsuit uh, that has been filed, um, that, uh, that these types of details that the member is getting into uh, would be appropriate to comment on these. This is something that is before the courts. The Honourable Member for Union Station. Uh, I can appreciate uh, the Minister's comments there. Uh, I would, you know, I think it's important to put on the record that swift action wasn't taken and that's the problem. And that's the point that I'm making. The Minister uh, saying that immediate action was taken. The action was taken after eight people died. The action was taken after a paramedic went on social media, used Reddit to put out a cry for help. This is days after it was already identified that there was a crisis. It's, I'm not, I'm not gonna minimize that, not for the minister, not for anyone. I'm not gonna minimize the significance of that. Eight people died in a matter of hours. Families traumatized, healthcare professionals traumatized, devastated. To say that immediate action was taken when it was after the fact and only because somebody posted what was going on on Reddit, to me is, uh, is, is, is wrong and it's dismissive of the realities of what took place and who was impacted by that. You know, Rivera, let's... Let's, let's just be frank, like Rivera did, a, did an abysmal job of, of, of taking specific actions to keep people safe. And I'm, I'm not speaking to the staff, I'm, you know, and even, even you know, management, I know what it means to work. I've worked in long-term care. I know what a privilege it is to work in those settings and provide care to residents and their families. And it's a community and you care deeply about the work that you do and the people that you do it with and for. Um, but ultimately, Rivera, this private company, did a, an abysmal job of things like cohorting patients, residents rather, at the beginning of the second wave of the pandemic. Uh, there were sick residents that were occupied in, in beds, uh, you know, separated from those who were not sick by only an end table, which is not cohorting. I want to make that explicitly clear. I've done that before. I feel like I need to state it again. You know, this went on for weeks. On November 2nd, the staff from the WRHA conducted an unannounced inspection of Maple's personal care home operated by Rivera. And the document, they documented rather several concerns with regard to staffing levels, but critically they concluded and I quote, no major breaches of standards were noted, end quote. Four days later, on the evening of November 6th, the facility called 911. Multiple ambulances responded to find residents neglected and dehydrated. Neglected and dehydrated. Multiple residents were dead or in critical condition. In at least one case, a resident had been dead for hours. On uh, page 30 of Dr. Lynn Stevenson's review, uh, she said that based on the PCH staffing triggers document that had been reviewed by the long-term care planning table and PRT director, the staffing shortages at Maples should have triggered a system-wide response involving provincial incident command, SWAT teams, mandatory redeployment, and potential emergency orders. 
None of that happened. None of that occurred. At the press briefing on February 4th, where her review was released, Dr. Stevenson was asked why requests for additional support were not heeded or heeded in as prompt a fashion as was required for such an emergency situation, which have alluded to already this question and the significance and importance of it. Dr. Stevenson replied, I don't know why the support was not given. I don't know why the support wasn't given. That's the response after all of this effort after all of this work to get answers to that most important question amongst the others, I don't know why the support wasn't given. The review established to get to the bottom of why so many faced or so many died under such horrible circumstances and her response is, I don't know why the request for help wasn't met. So my question to the minister, will the minister support an inquest into what happened? so that there's proper and full accounting of these horrible Madam events. Member's time is up. The Honourable Minister. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and and I thank you know the member um, for the question, and and you know I know they believe very passionately in this, and having worked in personal care home um, themselves as well, and so I certainly um, have respect for the work that the member has done in the past in a previous role, and uh, and you know I thank them for um, for their comments today. Um, you know, I believe that, you know, prompt action was taken to ensure that an independent review took place uh, with respect to um, calling on uh, Dr. Lynn Stevenson, uh, who had done this type of a review elsewhere as well, uh, I believe. And, uh, and so certainly um, it was appropriate to get her to, to look into this matter as well. Um, I also met... Uh, personally uh, with the families obviously it wasn't in a way that I would have liked because it was you know it was remotely obviously uh, by way of, of zoom uh, teams or whatever it was at the time and you know um, we obviously just can't get together uh, at this time but I did uh, reach out to those families twice um, and listen to their concerns and listen to their their stories and um, this is this is a tragic situation that transpired. Um, I believe, you know, and, and I also met with the staff as well because many of the staff, um, I know from their, uh, you know, what they what we spoke about in our meetings that, you know, the, many of these residents were good friends, and it was very very difficult for them and and what they went through as well, and so. Um, you know, it was very important to me to reach out to both uh, the family members as well as the staff and, uh, and listen to them. Um, so, you know, you know, we have um, 
conducted this independent review. This is not just a review that we will, um, you know, it's not just about Maples. It's about ensuring that all of our personal care homes uh, across the province of Manitoba, um, you know, that we implement uh, these recommendations in a broad scope across all personal care homes in Manitoba to ensure um, that, uh, you know, the safety and, and well-being uh, of those individuals who live in these personal care homes, this is their homes, and we want to ensure that um, they're safe and well cared for within those homes. And that's what we're working towards right now by implementing uh, the recommendations of the Stevenson Report. Before we go to the next question, is it is it a will to the House that we can take a, 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 a the committee uh, take a five minute recess? I'm, I'm yes, agreeing okay. I thought to you that. Said no. is, it, is it will to the, will to the committee to go for a five minute recess? Agreed? I'm agreed. Yeah. Agreed? Okay, so it's agreed, so we'll take a five minute recess. Thank you.
continue with the questioning. The honorable member for Union Station. I'd like to thank the uh, the minister for her previous comments. Uh, I think it's really important. It's really important uh, to have clarity on this um, for the reasons that I've already articulated. Um, but certainly, and the minister did kind of make the statement, not kind of, made the statement that she can't really comment on on this because of the civil lawsuit. The minister can, can certainly answer these questions. These are reasonable and appropriate questions to be asking uh, within this within this context. And but I do want to highlight again, the minister uh, said that they were prompt in calling a review. Okay, um, it, it takes me back to my previous point. You say you're prompt, sorry, rather, the minister says that they were prompt in calling a review, but the review, the reviewer couldn't answer a, a key component, a key question as to why the necessary identified supports in regards to staffing were withheld. It's not that the, the resources and the staffing issues were unknown. They were clearly uh, expressed they asked for help, but the reviewer says, I don't know why supports were withheld, because that's what it is. It's when you know that there's an issue, when you're aware that staffing is a problem, that those residents are not receiving the hours of care per day, per resident, that they need to be in order to be healthy, to have adequate care provided. You are aware of this, and then you don't provide the resource, you are withholding that resource. And out of this review, the only answer that we've got to that very important question, which I would say is fundamental to any decision making moving forward in terms of how we're going to support long term care in a proper way, the answer is I don't know why. Insufficient. That's, and that's the starting point for, from which further recommendations and implementation are coming from. From that point, the I don't know why is actually the starting point for the minister in terms of addressing uh, some of these concerns, which I think anyone, anyone who has any idea in regards to what happened at Maple's personal care home would say is wholly inadequate and insufficient. Will the minister support an inquest to ensure that proper and full accounting of the horrible events at Maples and other Rivera properties is done? Will the minister support an inquest? And if not, can the minister please provide her reason as to why? The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, thank the, the member for the question. And certainly, we do know that uh, the Chief Medical Examiner has the power um, under his uh, authority to call for an inquest um, into the death of, of an individual or, or um, a group of individuals in the province of Manitoba. And so, 
um, that is under his purview. I trust the work that, uh, that he does, and uh, you know, those, that's a decision um, that for for him to make. Uh, what I will say is that you know I do believe in getting Lynn Stevenson involved, um, who also conducted a similar review uh, in Nova Scotia, um, did a, an independent review here, came up with some recommendations. We've been very um, transparent and open about uh, where we're at with uh, with respect to implementing um the recommendations of that review we will continue to update manitobans every 90 days uh and so um you know and, and the member opposite is getting into details of issues that are currently before the courts and it would be completely inappropriate for me as the minister of a crown to comment uh on those so um you know i again i I did meet with the families uh, twice, and I, I met with um, the staff as well, and listened to, you know, their very heartfelt stories. Um, and this is obviously an extremely tragic situation. Um, but I believe that you know prompt action was taken to get an ind independent review done, to get the recommendations completed, so that we can um, ensure that we implement those recommendations in all of our personal care homes across the province of Manitoba, not just Maples. Although there are a number of recommendations that, that have been completed so far uh, in Maples, and those are outlined uh, again for all Manitobans to see online. The Honourable Member for Union Station. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, the fact that the minister you know, has said that she's met with staff, I, I think it's important meeting with families and those impacted uh, by the death of loved ones throughout this pandemic, certainly in long-term care homes. Uh, but I do think that it's a good step uh, for the minister to have met with staff, um, that those folks were significantly impacted and traumatized by the events uh, in, at Maple's personal care home and other personal care homes. And so I, I do wanna acknowledge uh, that. I think that that's a, a good step and I hope that the minister will uh, continue engaging with uh, staff in a manner that allows for them to contribute meaningfully to uh, how things are implemented so that they have their voices heard. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that. And, and going back to, since when we're talking about staffing here, I would like to get some clarification from the minister in regards to uh, the funding that, that is being, the flat funding, mind you, but the funding that is being allocated to personal care, long-term care, the minister is well aware of uh, the personal, the, the hours per day per resident in terms of direct resident care. Um, that is the, the, the standard in Manitoba. Minister would also be aware that uh, those, those targets were not being met during that time. I don't know where things are at right now in certain cases, but Certainly, you know, we're, we're advocating for an increase of those hours per day per resident uh, to reflect uh, better outcomes that are backed by evidence and research, 4.1 hours per day per resident. Um, so with that in mind, the minister is aware, based on the reports and the reviews that have been completed, that those hours, in many cases, Maple's personal care were not being achieved at all uh, per resident per day. Can the minister share with us how much of the funding that is being allocated to long-term care in the budget, how much of that is specifically going to address the staffing issues and the, the shortcomings around hours per day uh, for resident, direct resident care?
the Honourable Minister. Um, thanks. So I want to thank the member for the question. Uh, you know, I apologize. I'm just uh, still on a steep learning curve here in, in this area. So um, just, just uh, you know, um, just having a, a discussion with staff here for a moment here. So um, essentially, and the member opposite will will know that. Um, you know, according to, I guess, Kai High, about 71 cents of every dollar um, in the personal care home area goes towards uh, staffing. Uh, and so certainly um, what we uh, do, obviously, is uh, we um, conduct reviews uh, of those personal care homes. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, last year alone, we did a review of all personal care homes across the province of Manitoba. Um, within those reviews, there are provincial guidelines for scheduling and staffing uh, that uh, it is the expectation that those individual personal care homes are meeting those provincial guidelines. Uh, to the extent that they're not, um, it will be found within those reviews um, and you know it will affect licensing and things like that. So. Um, so that's sort of the the process of uh, of what takes place. If uh, you know, again, if they're not meeting those those guidelines, um, then uh, it, it could affect their um, their uh, license. Um, but it, the expectation would be that they would increase to ensure that they meet those guidelines. The honourable member for Union Station. I thank the minister for for that answer. Uh, certainly. In order for personal care homes, long-term care homes, to be able to do that, they need the increased resource by way of funding, so that they can have increased human resource in order to deliver uh, an increased amount of uh, direct care hours per resident per day. Um, I, I think I'll leave that particular question there for now. But I do want to clarify, uh, in regards to you know uh, proper accountability. In terms of what's happened at Maple's personal care home, Rivera personal care homes, uh, we're all well aware of the disproportionate negative outcomes uh, in these homes in long-term care during this pandemic. So would the minister, um, and I appreciate her comments in regards to the chief medical examiner, but I will say that the minister uh, could compel an inquiry uh, under the Manitoba Evidence Act. That is an option available to the minister. Will she do so? The Honourable Minister. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've already addressed this, that uh, certainly um, in the purview of the Chief Medical Examiner, um, I believe that, you know, prompt action was taken at the time to, um, to ensure that we had an independent review of what transpired as a result of uh, what happened at Maple's personal care home. Um, that resulted in a re review that took place and with the 17 recommendations and we're obviously in the process of implementing those recommendations. Uh, so um, I, I don't have anything more to say except that, uh, you know, the process will continue and, uh, you know, I know that there is a class action lawsuit um, that's before the, you know, before the courts right now. Uh, so we'll see the results of that. The Honourable Member for Union Station. I uh, thank the Minister for clarifying her position on that. As I stated before, it's uh, in her purview to, to call an inquiry under the Manitoba Evidence Act. Uh, it's disappointing to hear that she will not. As I've stated previously, uh, there are some significant questions that were unanswered um, as part of Dr. Stevenson's review and some key components in terms of how this government, this minister moves forward to address the concerns that have really been exacerbated during this pandemic. Um, so it's, it's disappointing to, to hear that that's the minister's stance on that, uh, but I do appreciate the minister clarifying that. Um, wondering if the minister can, can update us on the activities that she's undertaking this year as part of the phase two clinical services and prevention plan, uh, specifically what new actions are being taken under that plan this year?
the honorable minister. Yeah, I was just sort of looking into, I know the member opposite uh, spoke about, um, you know, my ability to call for an inquest and, and really that is under the purview of the chief medical examiner. Um, I think what the member opposite is talking about is, is public inquiries, uh, which is entirely uh, a different uh, a process. And uh, um, that is, is something that is, is not really under uh, this, this purview either, mostly under justice. Um, but, uh, but that's a full-blown public inquiry. Uh, I think the member opposite is talking about uh, the chief medical examiner and something that falls under, under their purview. So um, certainly I'll, I'll leave that at that. But the member opposite also talked about um, the uh, clinical preventative services plan. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to really thank our provincial clinical specialty leads. Um, I have the opportunity to meet with them uh, monthly and uh, we talk about a whole host of things that uh, they all believe and, and, and indeed, you know, I meet with, with, uh, with everyone who's responsible for different areas of, of the healthcare system as well. And, but this is just sort of one example of um, some of the changes that I think could benefit all Manitobans when we take um, sort of a, a cross uh, provincial sort of approach to how we, we look at uh, better health care for Manitobans. And I think um, one of the things is, is that, uh, that they have found is that, you know, there needs to be more consistent clinical standards across the entire province. And so those who are living in the north or those who are living in, in parts of rural uh, Manitoba, more remote communities, that we want to find a sort of a whole of, of, of province approach to um, various either whether it's surgical procedures or um, all sorts of medical procedures that need to take place um, and I think the thinking is that um, how do we maximize the use of facilities that uh, are across our province uh, for various procedures and so uh, just for example um, in the way of surgeries not everything needs to be done in in Winnipeg um, we have great facilities outside the city of Winnipeg and outside of our more urban centers like Brandon um, where uh, you know those you know, if there are ORs open to be able to perform certain surgeries and so on, we want to ensure that we're maximizing the use of, of um, the facilities that we've got now. Um, and part of this, uh, that's just sort of one example, but there's many things that we want to do to improve and really look at a, you know, a, a provincial approach to, to how we, you know, we'll, we'll look at things within our um, hospital system. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we did announce in this budget was, uh, I think it's over $800 million that is being uh, earmarked. Uh, 800 million? Uh, yeah, 800 million, I think, yeah, has been earmarked uh, for, we'll get the exact figure on that, but uh, for our um, capital expansion um, of, uh, you know, current facilities that we have and new facilities that are needed. Um, to ensure that we can take that uh, across the province and whole of, of a provincial approach um, to some of the things that we want to do. And so uh, at a very high level, there's many different things that we'll be looking at, but um, uh, I'll maybe just start with that when it comes to our clinical preventative services plan and, and some of the things that we're thinking about in the next phase. The honorable member for Union Station. I'm done. My question is the member for River Heights, I think, is going to. Okay. Mm -hmm. The honorable member for River Heights. Yeah. Um, I'll ask a question. If uh, the minister can't answer it uh, right away, perhaps she can provide an answer at the beginning of the next health estimates. Uh, the question is this. How many of the 1 million rapid tests which the government was provided with have been used, and what are the government's plans to use the remainder of the rapid tests? I think just why we're getting the oh, actual figures, I know we're getting close to the uh, the end of our time for today, but um, what I did want to say to the member is that um, rapid tests are being used um, in pilot projects. We've used them in personal care homes uh, in the past. We've used them for teachers and, and we've used them in childcare facilities. 
Um, we've utilized them in various businesses in the way of pilot projects as well. Uh, we're looking for more partnerships uh, in the community and we're in, certain dis we're in discussions uh, with various members of uh, the business community and um, other ways that we, can, uh, that we can utilize these rapid testing. Um, we know that there's a difference between, you know, uh, some of the rapid tests that we have access to. Some are more effective than others, and um, I won't get into the details on that, but I know that Dr. Rusin has spoken out about those, um, some of the, the challenges with some of the tests. But, uh, but certainly, uh, there was a time um, where we were not um, really at capacity in terms of our PCR testing, and so it was uh, sort of deemed to be um, better for us to um, access the, more of the, of the PCR testing for some of these individuals rather than utilizing the rapid testing. Uh, so when our numbers were, were uh, lower, we were not doing as, as many of those, those tests just because there simply was not the demand for it. Um, we were using more of the PCR tests at that time. And so uh, certainly I can endeavor to get the, the final numbers, uh, you know, in terms of the million that... Uh, uh, I, I don't believe it is a million, um, but uh, you know certainly I can get uh, a breakdown to to the member as to um, where those rapid tests have gone. The time being 5 p.m. I'm interrupting proceedings. The committee of supply will resume sitting tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. <laughs>